Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a productive weekend. China's outspoken ambassador to France has sparked controversy in Europe after his comments to French media over the weekend, questioning the sovereignty of post-Soviet countries. Quote. These ex-Soviet Union countries do not have effective status under international law, because there is no international accord to concretize their status as a sovereign country. End quote. The ambassador, who has been called a wolf warrior by some for previous controversial statements, made the comments after being asked if he considers the Crimean Peninsula to be part of Ukraine. The comments quickly started trending in a Europe already concerned about Chinese support for Russia, and in the middle of a political debate surrounding European China policy. After the comments, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. All announced plans to summon the top Chinese diplomats in their nations to explain the comments. In a Twitter post on Saturday, Latvia's foreign minister said the comments were unacceptable statements. His Estonian counterpart, the same day, called them false and a misinterpretation of history. The EU's top diplomat. Joseph Borrell said the remarks were unacceptable. Of course, Ukrainian officials dismissed the comments too. Ukraine's ambassador to France expressed that perhaps Lu should be asked who owns Vladivostok, referring to the far eastern port city, which the Russian Empire annexed from the Manchu Qing Empire in the 19th century. The Han Chinese-run modern state of China today. Heavily, though not exclusively, relies on the conquests of the Manchu Qing Empire to justify much of its modern territorial claims. Lu's comments are curious. A seasoned Chinese diplomat should be deeply sensitive to issues of sovereignty, and it's going to be difficult to communicate and be taken seriously that China will go to war over rocks in an ocean in order to protect the sanctity of sovereignty. While treating the sovereignty of entire nations in such a blasé manner, did the ambassador misspeak or not communicate his position correctly? Did he misunderstand the implications of his position? Have we misunderstood his position and intentions, or does he really mean what he says that post-Soviet nations do not have effective sovereignty, and as such? Russia has a legitimate claim over them. Indeed, several European states and media outlets have requested that Beijing clarify this very position. We should receive an official statement from the foreign ministry in Beijing today, Monday, or tomorrow. Some commentators expect Beijing to distance itself from the comments, or frame the episode as a misunderstanding. Quote: Liu Xiaoye has a radical, non-mainstream opinion. Which deviates from Beijing's official position and practice, end quote. Because these comments came from the PRC ambassador to France as well, the comments could also cause domestic political headaches for Macron, who we remember has been trying to make a more conciliatory approach to Beijing, in order to achieve a Chinese-backed peace solution in Ukraine. This controversy will fuel European opposition, critical to the French president's approach. Indeed, on Saturday, Lithuania's foreign minister tweeted, quote, "This is why the Baltic states don't trust China to broker peace in Ukraine," end quote, which was soon after retweeted by Taiwan's foreign minister Joseph Wu, who added, quote, "It's very sad that the history and sovereignty of the Baltic states are publicly twisted by the PRC ambassador. Trust me, it takes Taiwan to know and feel how far and how bad it can go." End quote. France's foreign ministry said that the comments had caused dismay, adding, quote, "It remains for China to say whether these comments reflect its position, which we hope is not the case." End quote. While this episode still has some time to burn, it will likely pass. However, these periodic diplomatic faux pas from Chinese diplomats are certainly not helping Beijing's diplomatic balancing trick in Europe. Next up, Chinese economic updates. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. It's just me making these episodes every day. It's a lot of work, but your guys' support is a huge source of motivation. 
subscribing and sharing is a huge help as well and for those who can go the extra mile and help me keep the channel financially sustainable patreon and buy me a coffee links are in the description below thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support provincial capital of wealthy zhejiang province and e-commerce hub hangzhou has become the first major city in China to extend greater labor protections to delivery drivers. With e-commerce and food delivery so popular in China these last several years, an army of delivery drivers riding on electric scooters have emerged. Their numbers are now estimated to be in the millions. These drivers typically come from poorer regions of the country, work very long hours, and are exposed to dangerous road conditions. The large e-commerce and food delivery platform companies that rely on them to operate typically treat them as third-party contractors rather than employees, meaning few formal labor rights benefits or protections. The new rules rolled out by the city of Hangzhou are intended to improve the labor conditions of these new proletaire, numbered at over 300,000 in the city. E-commerce platform operators and online food service providers in Hangzhou must sign labor contracts with eligible takeout drivers and allow them to join the social insurance system. Next up, some good news for Beijing. After a shocking year in 2022, foreign capital has surged back into Chinese mainland stocks in Q1 of this year, with 22 billion US dollars net inflow into yuan-denominated A-share markets in the quarter. Quote, foreign investors own about 5% of Chinese stocks. This is a much lower share than in other large developing economies, but much higher than in the past. End quote. It seems that some global investors are betting big on China this year. We will see in the coming months whether these bets pay off. And finally, over the weekend, Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin writes that contributions to China's fledgling private pension accounts have reached about 20 billion yuan, 2.9 billion US dollars, since their inception in November, with just 70% of the funds invested. Quote, suggesting hesitation among some participants due to unfamiliarity with the system. End quote. The outlet writes that of the funds invested, Bank deposits have been the most popular choice, attracting close to 60% of the total. Mutual funds took up about 30%, and bank wealth management products around 4%. Under the new private pension program, participants set up two funds, one government-run account and one account with a qualified institution, like a bank. However, as we've just seen, this program remains quite unpopular, and even those who use it are not investing the funds in high levels. According to the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, as of the end of 2022, just over 19 million people had set up accounts, but only 6.13 million had made contributions. According to the Insurance Asset Management Association of China, personal pensions accounted for less than 1% of the country's total pension funds in 2021. For comparison, in the United States, the ratio was nearly 40%. We can hear the concern in the words of the Chinese analysts as they discuss China's pension issues, a gathering crisis which one commentator called a slow-motion train wreck. Quote, Officials and experts have previously flagged concerns about a lukewarm response to the new system, which carries the hopes of significantly boosting China's minuscule personal pension market as the state-run pension system struggles under a rapidly aging population and a dwindling workforce. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you everybody for watching. Have a good Monday, have a productive week, and I will see you all tomorrow.